Hey guys, my name is Brad. I'm the lead pastor here at New Life Church, and I want to welcome you to our online teachings. One of our core convictions as a church is that everyone is welcome, no one is perfect, and anything is possible. Now, I know that for some of us, coming into a church building might be intimidating, it might be scary, and I get that. But I want you to know that there is always a place for you here at New Life and that you were made for real in-person community. We meet on Sundays in downtown Wayland. You can check out our website for more information on service times. But for now, I hope God speaks powerfully to you through his word. Love you guys. Well, good morning, New Life family. How are we doing this morning? You guys are a very quiet crowd this morning. That was, a, that was a dad joke. I'm sorry. I just had to get one out of the way. Hey, I just before I begin with the sermon uh, this morning, I just want to say thank you for your graciousness this past week um, as we have had to make some kind of tough, honestly, very imperfect decisions about where to go and what to do in response to rising COVID numbers. And so I want to just say really quick two things to you uh, this morning. Number one is... You may not know this, but our staff has worked their tails off this week just to pivot. Um, Trent has done a ton just to improve our live stream for this week. Uh, Josh has been doing a bunch in in student ministry. I think of Trish for kids and and Lori, um, our admin. And so I just want to thank them for everything that they've done this week uh, because it has been crazy and this is not usually how we like to plan or lead. So thank you guys so much for that. Uh, The second thing I want to let you guys know about who are watching online is that um, I have a commitment to you guys. We have a huge value of gathering and gathering to worship in person here at New Life. I value that a lot, and I don't take it lightly for us to gather online. And so my commitment to you is to keep a close eye on where things are at and do everything we can to help us be able to open and resume in-person services as fast as possible. However, with that being said, I also want to let you know that Every single week, I am hearing stories from people who have found our church because of the live stream that we offer. Uh, Just this last week, I met with someone who hasn't attended a service in person, but has been watching for months uh, because we've had a live stream out there. And so this live stream really is an incredible tool for us to reach new people. And our heart is to continue improving it, investing in it, and really turning it not just into a live stream, but into an online campus for people who are far from God or who may never have set foot in our church so that they can experience the love of Jesus. It's already doing that, and I believe God is just getting started with this tool that we have available to us. So that being said, will you join me in prayer as we dive into our teaching this morning? Let's pray. God, you are so good to us, and you are holy, God. And even as we enter into this Thanksgiving week, God, I just think of the tremendous number of reasons that each and every one of us have to be thankful. Man, thankfulness seems like such a contrast to the world that we're living in where we feel like we've lost so much this year. There's so many reasons to complain or be upset, God. We are so thankful, first and foremost, to who you are and what you've done in each and every one of our lives. God, I pray that that won't just be the posture of our hearts this week, but we will live a life that is focused on gratitude towards you. Jesus, I pray that you will speak through me this morning, that the words I share will not be my own words or my own thoughts, God, but that they will be directly from your word. God, your word is powerful. And so I pray that you will speak through me and that as a result, we will all look more like you as a, re- as a result of what we share today. So God, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. Hey, we got two people there from the band that time. That's good. So I want to begin with sharing a story with you. We're in the third week of our series, Life Hacks. And uh, this series is all about how can we have a deeply rooted soul in Jesus during a time where everything feels chaotic. And so I want to take you back to eighth grade. I was a student coming back from summer break and starting a brand new year of school. And my friends came running up to me the second that I walked into the the hallway, into the room, and they said, Brad, Brad, we are so excited to tell you we met a girl this summer. And we think you guys would hit it off really, really well. Now, if you can imagine, pimple-faced braces Brad finds out a girl might actually like him. Man, I'm I'm gonna pursue that like any eighth grader 
would. So I get her AOL Instant Messenger screen name. Anybody remember AOL Instant Messenger? Yeah. I get her screen name. I get home that day, and I cannot fast enough hop on my bike, ride to the library, wait for 20 minutes for the dial-up internet to kick in so I can message this girl, Summer, whose screen name was Summer Lovin' 2345. <laughs> Man, was I excited. And so I start talking to her. And of course, we hit it off really well. I'm asking her questions about her life, and she lives up north in Traverse City. She had met my friends at summer camp that summer, and uh, it was just, it was a great conversation. We hit it off. We even exchanged pictures with each other, and she thought I was cute. And uh, so I was excited to date this girl. And so we start chatting every single day. Every single day I get to the library as fast as I can to talk to Summer. Eventually, we talk on the phone. We're just getting to know each other better. I mean, this is a match made in junior high heaven, okay? I, I, I believed I'd found my soulmate in this moment. It was, just, it was just good. Until a few months into the relationship, about two months, my friends, the same ones that had introduced me to Summer, came up and they said, Brad, we need to tell you something. That did not sound good. I was like, what do you need to tell me? They were like, yeah, we made Summer up. She's, she's not real. She's, she's fake. I said, yeah, yeah, but, but I, I have a picture of her. They go, yeah, we just found a random girl on Google image search. I was like, but, but I've talked to her on the phone. They're like, yeah, we just had one of our friends pretend to be Summer. Let's just say those friends are former friends now. We don't speak anymore. But I was, I was crushed for two months. I dated a fake girl. Man, I'm really telling an embarrassing story for you guys this morning. I dated a fake girl. And, and as I was thinking about the relationship, I began to think to myself, how could I have dated somebody fake for two months? How could I have believed a lie? How could I have been so easily deceived for that time? And as I thought about it more, what I realized is that the reason that I was lied to so easily is because I didn't know Summer personally. Sure, we had chatted on the phone. Sure, we had exchanged information and checked out each other's MySpace accounts and all of that stuff. But I had never encountered her personally. Skype wasn't a thing back then. She lived out of town. I didn't have a driver's license. I had never met Summer personally. And so as a result, I was so easily deceived. I was tricked into living a false reality, into living a lie for two months. And as I look at the landscape of our world today, I see so many people deceived. So many people living out Lies where reality and illusion are often mixed. You see, we live in a world of, of fake news and conspiracy theories. By the way, my friend's a legit conspiracy theorist, and he tells me it's not even fun to be a conspiracy theorist anymore because everybody is a conspiracy theorist nowadays. The fact is, telling truth from lie in our world is so difficult, and I would argue to you that the reason we have such a hard time doing that is because our world and many in our church don't know truth personally. Haven't encountered truth personally. Which has led in my generation to what I believe is one of the most toxic worldviews out there right now. It's this one right here. That I'm just living my truth. You just live your truth. It's Oprah nonsense right there. Just live your truth. Just, just do what feels good in the moment because truth is inside of you. Guys, this is a toxic worldview, but it's a great worldview if you live in a world of one person where your actions don't actually impact other people. This is a great worldview for me, myself, and I, and everybody else get out of the way. But I don't know about you, but for me, when I look into my own desires, my own needs, my own mental maps for how the world works, when I look to myself and my truth, it doesn't lead me to life. It leads me to death. 
Because the collection of ideas that we navigate the world by are often wrong, and they can easily deceive us if we do not know truth personally. Living my truth gets us a world where me too is the norm, and we have to navigate a world with so much sexual assault and violence from people just living their truth. Living my truth, if I let my, my kids live their truth, they'd be running around naked eating junk food all day long. Let's be honest, so would I. The point is, the point is, living our truth can get us to a place where greed is the norm in our world, where right and wrong is just relative, and we can hurt people and treat people as a means to our own end. And before you think living my truth is a problem reserved just for liberal universities on the coasts of our country, living my truth in Wayland can sound a lot like, man, I'm a free American who can just do whatever I want, whenever I want, however I want to do it. Friends, it's a concept found nowhere in Scripture because truth is not internal. Truth has a name. And his name is Jesus. And Jesus believed that you and I need to know truth personally. In fact, he says in, in John 8, verse 31 here, he says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What Jesus is saying here is the only truth that will set you free is the truth that you know personally, that you know intimately. Truth for Jesus wasn't just this abstract set of moral principles. It was found in him as a person. Why does this matter for your Monday morning or the everyday stuff of your life? Because where you search for truth determines how you respond to rising COVID numbers. Where you search for truth determines where you look for for hope in a world where hopelessness seems to be all around. Where you go for truth has implications for how you see a crumbling economy or a financial strain, how you can live with faith still in the midst of your finances falling apart. And believe me, I've been there. Where you search for truth reminds you that your life wasn't built on something as feeble as finances or human security. It's built on something greater than yourself. Where you search for truth forces you to put your dang clothes on and eat your veggies like my kids struggle with. You see, where you go for truth determines your ethics of right and wrong. And, and, and knowing truth personally allows you to live in a sinful world and love that world without becoming a slave to sin yourself. Knowing truth personally has so many implications for your life and for my life too. And the, the idea that I want to center this sermon around this morning is echoing Jesus' words here that the only way the truth can set you free is if you know truth personally. It's the only way. The only way that you can know or that you, the truth can set you free is if you know truth personally. And friends, here's my pastoral heart for you. My heart is that you would look at the world with all of its sin, with all of its pain and heartache and uncertainty, and that in the midst of that, you wouldn't try to escape from it, but you would enter into it as a carrier of truth, where truth seems so elusive. That we would be a community of truth seekers and truth speakers. That when truth doesn't align with our own desires, that we would adjust ourselves and get uncomfortable so that we can live as people who are freed by the truth because we know truth personally. And so how? How can I know truth personally? If you have your Bibles or your phones or your smart devices, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 14. I'm going to read it for you here. Paul is speaking to his spiritual son, Timothy, and this is what he says. But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise 
for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Paul, this guy who, who wrote a good portion of the New Testament, he's writing to his spiritual son, Timothy, who's a young pastor in a church in a town called Ephesus. Now, Paul is at the very end of his life here. He's, he's literally got months left to live. He's writing this letter in chains and in prison. And what he's saying to Timothy is, Timothy, the scriptures that you've known, this source of truth that you've known, they're able to make you wise for salvation in Jesus Christ because Timothy lived in a town, in a city called Ephesus, that would have been a lot like a New York or a Los Angeles for us today. It was an epicenter of culture, music. It was an epicenter of morality, however illy placed that is. In the middle of the, the town of Ephesus, there was a, a temple, a temple dedicated to the goddess Artemis, who was the goddess of fertility. And people would just flock to this temple to, to give financial offerings. It was a huge financial center to participate in extremely lewd sexual acts like prostitution and orgies and things like that in order to just win the favor of Artemis. It's into this world that Paul is speaking these words to Timothy, and he's saying, Timothy, don't neglect the scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation. In other words, this book, this, this collection of writings, it's not just abstract moral principles. The power of this book lies in the person it reveals to us. That this book, from start to finish, is all about truth, but not truth as an abstract idea. It's about truth as a person, a person named Jesus. This might sound a little bit controversial to some of you, but the Bible is not about the Bible. It's not. The Bible is not about the Bible. The Bible is about Jesus. I was a youth pastor for many years, and one of the things that we did every single night or every single year in youth group is we had an opportunity uh, to have doubt nights. And so what doubt nights look like is we would just allow students to ask question after question after question of their doubts around scripture, around God, around theology, and the questions these students asked blew me away. I made the mistake of putting my phone number on the screen for the students, and they literally broke the vibrator in my phone because they were texting me so many questions on a single night. The questions that they asked were things about reconciling scripture with the nature of their real world and how do I seek truth? And they, they had questions about the Bible and science and did God create the world in seven days and the Bible in history and the Bible in ethics. I mean, they had all of these questions. And the single thing that I learned as a youth pastor from all of the questions that they were asking is that, man, we have done a disservice to these students because we have taught them that the Bible is about moral, abstract truth principles and not rooting themselves in a person named Jesus. And on the flip side of that, we all know people who know the Bible cover to cover. I mean, they can quote all of it, but it's not like it's doing anything in their lives, right? Right? It's not like they're growing in love towards other people. It's not like they're growing in hospitality or pursuing justice in the world or embodying grace or being gen generous. You know why there's mean Christians? Because they've made the Bible about the Bible and not the Bible about Jesus. Don't take my word for it. Look at what Jesus himself says about the scriptures to the experts in the Bible when he was living here on earth. Look what Jesus says in, in John 5 here. He says, you are busy, he's speaking to these religious experts, these Bible experts, you are busy analyzing the scriptures, frantically pouring over them in hopes of gaining eternal life. Everything you read points to me, yet you still refuse to come to me so I can give you the life you're looking for, eternal life. Friends, the Bible is not about the Bible. The Bible is about Jesus. And I know far too many people who have been beat over the head by this book in the name of truth. That they just view God as a strict rule maker 
a cosmic buzzkill? Someone who just wants to have a bigoted view of sexuality or money? Or whatever it might be. Jesus' understanding of truth, however, was that truth is a person. It's not an abstract principle. It is a person, and his name is Jesus. The only way that you can know, tr- or the only way the truth can set you free is if you know truth personally. I want you to consider the story of Timothy. Timothy is this guy that Paul is writing to, this phenomenal pastor. He's a young guy, and he's a pastor in the town of Ephesus. But Timothy wasn't always a pastor. So you see, before he was a pastor, he, he was living in a town called Lystra. And uh, Timothy's mom, you can read about this in Acts 16, we're not going to go there, but Timothy's mom is described as a Jewish believer. Okay, so she's a devout religious woman, a Jewish believer. Timothy's dad, he is a pagan Greek. And so these two people, this Jewish believer and this pagan Greek, get together, they have a baby, and his name is Timothy. Now, this might not sound like a big deal for our world that we live in today, but Timothy would have been called what's, what's called a mumser, okay? He was a, a, a child born out of a forbidden relationship. And so this This mumser named Timothy would have had a really hard life as a result of this. In fact, his whole life would have been marked by his mother's sin because he was born out of a forbidden relationship. His mom, a Jewish believer, got together with a pagan Greek. In fact, one of the the truths that Timothy would have known from, from his childhood is a Torah truth that anyone born out of a forbidden marriage shall be excluded from the assembly of God to the 10th generation. Timothy would have been an outcast as a mumser. His mom would have possibly brought him to temple to be circumcised, to be dedicated, and I imagine him getting rejected. And the priest and the rabbi saying to his mom, but, but ma'am, your, your son's a mumser. He, he's not welcome here in this church. In fact, he can't even go worship in the court of the Gentiles where the Gentiles worship because he's a mumser. He is a third-class citizen in the church. Timothy would have walked through his entire life not being allowed to study the scriptures, not even being allowed to marry unless he married another mumser. He would have been excluded from other kids because his mom was bad for his entire life. His Label would have been Mumser. His mother's sin would have followed him everywhere he went. And for Timothy, the truth of this book would have been used to beat him over the head over and over again. But then one day, everything changes for Timothy. Because a man named Paul shows up to his town and begins to preach. Can you imagine Timothy hearing the words, in Jesus, there are no Greeks, there are no Jews, there are no male, no female, no slave, no free. We are all one in Christ. And Timothy, hiding in the shadows, ashamed as this mumser, thinking to himself, but, but I'm hungry for this gospel. I'm hungry for it. But it's not for me, because I'm a mumser. Eventually, Paul sees something in Timothy. He sees this kid with a fire for Jesus. Would Timothy have said, but Paul, I can't can't go with you because I'm a mumser. I imagine Paul responding, but Timothy, there are no mumsers in Jesus. There's no Greek. There's no Jew. There's no slave. There's no free. We are all one in Christ. You see, friends, for Timothy, truth was not an abstract concept. Truth was a person named Jesus with a name. And it was the key to living freely. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. For Timothy, the truth found in Scripture meant he had belonging. It meant he had purpose. It meant he had family. Can you imagine what Timothy's mom's reaction would have been when he walked in the door and said, Mom, I'm, I'm following this guy named Paul. He is calling me to be a pastor, a missionary with him. I, I imagine the, the tears flowing down her, her eyes, down her face as, 
She thought of her son and herself as a third-class citizen. I imagine these tears as God steps into her story and says, I want your son to be like Paul so that he can be like Jesus. Paul's words to Timothy are, don't neglect the sacred scriptures that can make you wise for salvation in Jesus, meaning all of it, everything is pointing to Jesus. Some of us grew up in a home. Some of you grew up in a home where you were reminded, reminded every single day that you are worthless, that you won't amount to anything, that your value is based on how good or well-behaved you are, or the numbers on the scale, or the amount in your bank account. And for so many of us, this book was weaponized against you in the name of truth, and you still feel the bruises on your head for being beaten with it. See, this book has been weaponized by so many people because of your own sin or the sin of someone around you. And here's what I want you to understand about the Bible. This is so crucially important to being set free by truth. It's this right here. It's that the Bible is not abstract principles in the name of truth. It's an interconnected story that shows truth has a name. I want to say that again. The Bible is not just abstract principles in the name of truth. It's an interconnected story that shows us truth has a name and his name is Jesus. I'll often hear Christians walk around and say, well, we just need to stand up in the name of truth. We just need to defend the truth. And my response to that would be, yes, truth matters. But instead of defending the Bible in the name of truth, why don't we show the world that truth has a name and his name is Jesus? Take any truth issue that you will. Sexuality, for example. That's a big, big hot button issue right now. And I think there's far too many Christians walking around the world with just an abstract opinion because they've read something somebody wrote from this book at one time, and it's not deeply rooted in the person of Jesus. Friends, every single truth that you stand on that you will find in this book is pointing you towards Jesus. Let me explain how that happens with marriage and sexuality. God designed marriage for a man and a woman for two sexually opposite people to come together to die to themselves and become one flesh. That's true. But don't let it stop there. Because all it takes is a reading of Ephesians to see that God's reason for marriage is actually deeper than that. Because when two unlike people come together, when they die to themselves and become one flesh, the truth that lies in that is that Jesus did the same thing with his church. That two opposite, contrasting people, the Jesus and his church, when they make the decision to die to themselves, there is a marriage, a one flesh union that happens there, and the world gets to see a picture of the gospel. The Bible is not abstract principles in the name of truth. It is an interconnected story showing us that truth has a name, and you do not have to be a Bible scholar. You do not have to have a Bible degree to understand this. You just need to be a Bible reader. You need to read the Bible asking the question, where is this pointing to Jesus? How is this pointing me to Jesus? Where can I see Jesus? Where can I see the character of God in this story? Whether it's the stories of mumsers or prostitutes, whether it's the stories found in this book of prophets or kings or talking donkeys or the right way to slaughter a lamb for sacrifice, whether it's stories of outcasts or orphans, whether it's history or poetry or wisdom literature or allegory, all of it is true because all of it is pointing us to a personal relationship with the truth, Jesus himself. Do you think Timothy the Mumser understood this to his core? I mean, this truth literally transformed his life, gave him family, and offered him purpose and belonging in a world that rejected him. Let's keep reading here Paul's words to Timothy, continuing in verse 16 and 17 of 2 Timothy 3. Paul says this, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching for reproof, 
for correction and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Paul gives Timothy four words for how to seek truth in Scripture. Four words that are so incredibly important for us to understand. The first purpose of this book is for teaching. Now, teaching, teaching might be the type of thing where we think about it as kind of abstract moral principles, right? Ways to live. But there's actually two Greek words for teaching used in the New Testament. The first Greek word is this idea of abstract truth, kind of abstract moral principles teaching. That's not the word Paul uses here, though. The word Paul uses is a different Greek word. And this word for teaching in the New Testament, when it's used, always refers to the proclamation of the gospel. All scripture is useful for proclaiming the gospel. All scripture is useful for rooting yourself in this gospel story, the story of grace that you and I are a part of. The Bible is not useful for just teaching you loose moral principles. It is useful for rooting your life in the person of Jesus. You see, scripture is useful for for keeping your feet planted in this story. It's useful for teaching you and reminding you to unlearn the cramped rhythms of worth and performance that our world measures our worth by. In other words, Scripture is this, this anchor, this root, an anchor of truth in a spiraling world where truth is so easily lost and compromised. So it's useful for teaching. The second one here is it's, it's useful for reproof or rebuking. Some other translations say rebuking here. This idea here is that the, God, the, the Bible, Scripture, has the power to cut through every false self, every layer of living your own truth based on pretense and outer image. Do you think Timothy had lingering questions about his identity when he was a pastor? Do you think the, the words in the back of his mind that he would play over and over again, but Timothy, you're a mumser. You're never going to know the Scriptures. You're never going to experience belonging or family. You think Timothy had questions about his his identity? What scripture has the power to do is rebuke those lies in his life and in your life. Scripture is described as sharper than a double-edged sword that has the power to cut through every false sense of self, every secondary identity, the core no one else sees about you or no one else knows. Scripture can cut through that and offer you the freedom of truth. In Exodus Moses discovers that no one, no one can see God face to face and live. The same thing is true in the New Testament, that no one can have a true encounter with Jesus without the outer man, the false self, self dying and becoming who we truly are in Christ. What label have you believed that the Bible needs to reproof, needs to rebuke in your life? Worthless? You believe the label self sufficient? Have you believed the label independent or fat or dirty or sinful? Scripture can cut through all of these and rebuke these lies in your life and show you that you are cherished. You are beloved. That in Christ you are known. You are adopted. That is what it means to use Scripture for rebuke. The third one here is correction. Correction is this idea of bringing something broken into alignment or wholeness. Think of an image of a broken bone. What scripture has the power to do is wrap that bone up and heal it and correct it over time. It resets the broken parts of us, the parts we can name and the parts we can't name. What wounds in your life exist that scripture can correct and heal over time? What sins in your life? What areas of of sin issues in your life that you have not talked about, that you've never dealt with, that you need to allow the grace of God and the truth of Scripture to reset and correct in your life? The power in this word is that it can do this. And then the last one here is training in righteousness. This is this idea of an intentional, long process where a child is guided into adulthood. 
whether he or she is initiated. Think of it as the Jewish concept of a bar mitzvah. It's, it's a coming of age. That's what scripture can do for us. It can allow us to come of age in our faith. By the way, this is a process that Timothy would have been excluded from as a momzer because he wouldn't have had this able, available to him. The word of God can train you in righteousness. It can train you to the norms of a different kingdom, a different world bursting forth right here among this one. Paul encourages Timothy to firmly root himself in the truth of the gospel in a town like Ephesus. He doesn't tell him to leave Ephesus. He doesn't tell him to escape Ephesus. He tells him to root himself in the truth of God's word so that he can love Ephesus in all of her brokenness, in all of her uncertainty, in all of her pain, because the only way the truth can set you free is for you to know Jesus, the truth, personally. It's the only way. The only way truth can set you free is if you know truth personally. So I'm going to invite the band to make their way back up. And I just want to give you some practical ways that you can, you can put this into practice for you, that you can actually use this word not just as an abstract set of principles of truth, but as the invitation to know a person named Jesus, who is truth. So the question I want to leave you with today is, are you saturating your life in truth? Are you in this word, looking for Jesus through every character, every verse, every storyline, every concept? Are you looking for Jesus as you read this word? And there's three things that you can do to put this into practice, to allow the truth of this word to actually transform you and renovate. The first one is rhythm. This just means having a regular routine of being in the word of God, saturating yourself in this word. A time daily that you get alone, that you turn off your phone, that you get quiet, that you spend time with your Savior, not because you have to, not just because you want to be more moral or more good, but because you want to know Jesus, whose name is truth. So setting up a rhythm don't underestimate this. Anything worthwhile, anything worth doing in your life is built around rhythm, whether it's eating, drinking, exercising, parenting, all of it is built around rhythms. Build a rhythm in your life to seek the truth of God's word. The second one here is read. Some people need a reading plan if they're type A and super goal-oriented. Other people just need to immerse themselves in the story of this book and allow God to speak through more random passages. Whatever works for you, whatever is built around your rhythm, I want to encourage you to read this book. The goal is not the number of pages that you read. If that causes you guilt, if you fall behind, you're, you're missing the point of reading this book. The reason we read this book is not to accomplish some goal. It's to see the person of Jesus on every single page. To see the truth of who he is and what he's done. And so read. And then the last one here is reflection. This is the single most important part of the process. Because we don't actually grow from what we read. We grow from what we reflect on when we read. And so a simple question that you can ask as you read the text is, how is this showing me Jesus? Where is Jesus in this story? If you don't know, if you're confused, you can look online. You can send me an email and ask me. I'd love to help you. I don't promise all the answers. But as you're searching the scriptures and looking for Jesus, reflect on that. Allow him to form you and transform you. You see, friends, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, it was scripture that flowed from his lips. When Jesus was challenged, scripture flowed from his lips. When he was distressed, when he was anxious, scripture flowed from his lips. When Jesus was hanging on a cross, giving his life for you, scripture flowed from his lips. And so if this is a book of just good kind of broad moral principles that are kind of a good philosophy, 
that allow you just to live your truth. And sure, read it once in a while. Admire it from a distance. Comment on it. But if this book is a picture of truth himself, of Jesus made known to each and every one of us, then fall on your knees before your Father and build a life on it. Saturate yourself in it. Memorize it. Apply it. Reflect on it in every area of your life. And friends, when you do that, I promise you, Truth will not be an abstract principle or a bigoted concept like so many talk about it today. Truth will have a name, and his name is Jesus, and you will know him personally. Let me pray, and then we're going to worship this morning. Jesus, I I think of your words in John when you say, you are the way, you are the truth, you are the life. And Jesus, I pray for each and every person watching this morning who maybe have misunderstood what truth is in your word. Maybe they've been beat up by the Bible in the name of truth. The Bible should convict us, but it doesn't lead us into self-hatred and and guilt. Maybe for others, they know the Bible from cover to cover, but they do not know truth personally. Personally. So God, I pray that as we engage with this word, as we engage to be people who are set free by the words in this book, God, that we may experience truth personally. God, we thank you for who you are, what you've done, and what you continue to do. Jesus, we love you so much. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.